In this episode, Jahed and I speak with Maxim Ismailov, the former founder of Roomstorm and current founder of Winding Tree. Winding Tree is setting up a decentralized marketplace for the $7 trillion travel industry, which is currently dominated by platforms like Booking.com and TripAdvisor. We discuss the challenges of unseating these players with a model that distributes more of a cut of tourism dollars to accommodation providers and local economies. We dig into the acquisition model of the market incumbents and ideate on tokenomics that could better enable virality through community incentives. We hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks for joining us, Maxim. Thank you for having me, Jihad, Martin. This is a pleasure. All right, man. Well, let's get in. We always like to start this by getting a little background on you. So could you tell us a bit about yourself? Where does your story start? Let's keep it there, and then we'll get into the Web3 stuff later. Yeah, yeah, no. I love that XKCD comic, like, hey, or no, it was Dilbert or something. Where did it start? Okay, earlier civilizations didn't have a concept of zero. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's start there. Perfect. All right, so starting <laughs> from zero and numbers. Great. Go. Yeah. So where did my entrepreneurial journey start? Well, I guess really in 2014 in San Francisco when I was there working as a coder, as a developer, and we got accepted to YC which is, I guess, a topic for a whole another podcast. Uh, I would love to spill some things there. And uh, yeah, yeah, eyebrows. And so, yeah, that's where it started. And I started working on application in the trial space. And I'm a coder. I've been coding for a long time. Started with basic on a ZX Spectrum computer, which was called actually Bashkiria, which is the place where I come from. So it was like a local a clone of that architecture, which was Ooh. interesting. I still have it somewhere, believe it or not, and may nice. even work. That's kind of my pipe dream to bring it where I am right now and just make it work with some sort of CRT TV and stuff like that. So that, that would be awesome. Oh, but anyway. Man, CRT, amazing. Go on. Yeah. And so that's where my journey started. I'm a coder, as I said, and I realized that travel is just so like to a person who comes from the world where you just have APIs that you can put together very quickly, mash something up and just make it work. Working in the trial space for the first time really was just like, what is this shit? Like everything is so hard. Like all of a sudden you're like walking on the bottom of the ocean instead of running, you know? I'm like, what is this? What is this craziness? And I started digging into really why that's the case. And that's where really I found this, I don't know, you tell me guys, if like a hidden truth or not, or if everyone is aware of this and I was just an idiot, if I found out that there are only a few intermediaries in the trial space, just really a handful yeah, that's the case. Of course, there is no incentive for them to innovate. And yeah, people are just absolutely not aware that they're paying 20% commission every time they book a hotel or they book an airline flight. Right. And yeah, and that's what I was like, okay, so wait, wait, wait. We have this heavily centralized sort of industry here. And we have a tool, which is the blockchain, which is a tool for decentralization. How about we smash those two together and you know just see, see where it goes? So that's where this story started. Cool. So that's like the, that's the short version. So then if we go back a little bit to YC before you really you got into travel booking and all that, was blockchain a thing during your first play? I believe it was called Roomstorm or did you just kind of just like, hey, great. I know how to code stuff and doing it my whole life. I'm in San Francisco. I can do YC and then, whoa, what should I do? What the hell is going on in travel? Is that kind of like an accurate? That's exactly. Yeah. Very cool. accurate. Very <laughs> accurate. If you're recording this, I'm going to steal that from you. That, that's much faster than that explainer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I think like, so this was Roomstorm and you were taking a look at all the intermediaries that were just involved in travel booking. And in some ways, these big wigs who are competing against each other, but not really, it's like maybe a handful of them. You were looking at this from the perspective of user experience initially or what? What was the reason you decided to get into that, that space? So the reason to look into that, no, it wasn't from the perspective of the user in the beginning. As I said, you know, I'm a developer and oh, like, what is innovation? Innovation is experimentation, right? Let's just like, I don't know, let's make as much stuff as possible giving the tools that we have. But in the trial space, absolutely impossible to do. Like everything takes months, negotiations, back 
And I don't know, like 2015, 2016, I was going to conferences, to travel conferences, to just learn about the space and stuff. And the things that I heard there were just ridiculous. They're like, guys, this is the greatest innovation since sliced bread in the travel industry. We started using XML. I'm like, you got to be shitting you. I mean, you people like, what? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Well, yeah. that was the news. That was the big news. And, or they're like, the, we fun. Yeah. And for the non-developers, just you know, real quick, like that's essentially like saying, hey, we have this SOAP API and it's year 2020 or something, right? Like something, yeah, yeah, even yeah. to break that down further, that's still too developer talk. It's essentially like saying, hey, it's 2020 and we're now adding speaker phones to our dial and, <laughs> you know, like to our, to yeah, our no, dial phones over there. It's absolutely, I mean, so they were like, I guess, for people who are not technical, the same conference, and there would be some big company saying, again, mind you, that was year 2015. The iPhone was around for like already for eight years or something like that. And they're like, hey, yeah. we have this iPhone app to do something. I'm like, this is like any other technical conference, you will be laughed out of the room, right? There, yeah. it's like, yo, oh, cool, well, iPhone application is amazing. Yeah. And there was such a contrast between these two spaces. You go to like a technical conference and everyone's like, guys, we developed this framework, just use it. It's open source. Let's, okay, so here's all the APIs. Here's how you do this mashup. Let's use like all of the stuff. And hey, yeah, let me help you and stuff like that. There is just all of those big companies, very top down. Mm -hmm. All the conference spots are paid. So it's kind of pay to play sort of thing most yeah. of the time. Very heavily controlled. And I mean, like all of those big wigs, big corporations sponsor those conferences. And of course, they control the agenda. They control everything. Like it's just such an insanely closed space. And from the developer's perspective, and just, I don't know, from a human kind of perspective, from a thinking human kind of perspective, space is very close. And therefore, it's very hard to innovate. The stories that I heard from other entrepreneurs trying to work in this space, again, they're just out of this world in terms of insanity of what people have to build those startups in the travel space. So that's just... Okay. Well, I would love to hear more if you could give us one, because really what caught my attention a little while back is when you said like, maybe you guys already know this. Well, one, I definitely don't. I've never tried to start like an Expedia or something like that, yeah. right? That's, that's yeah. been around for a while. So tell us a little bit about like, what is it like behind the scenes? What do they control? Is it rent extraction that's happening on the other side of it? Is there, you know, what is it a monopsony, monopoly? Who are the stakeholders and like what's happening behind the scenes when you're maybe at going to Google flights or going on Skyscanner or something and saying, I want to go to this place. What's actually happening? Right. So there is, where do I start? It's, bit, it's an oligopolistic kind of situation that we have in our hands right now. There are a few of those in intermediaries in terms of specifically in the United States, there are two intermediaries, Priceline and Expedia. And you would think you have a choice as a consumer. You like you think, oh, I go to Kayak or I go to Hotels.com or I go to Orbitz or I go to like any of all of those websites belong to one or the other. Mm -hmm. And you go to, you can go, you can Google Expedia Group brands or Priceline brands, and you will see all the websites that they control and own, right? So as a consumer, we have an illusion of choice where there is no choice or very close to zero choice. And so, and this is just the hospitality part, right? And again, we can touch upon the airline part as well, where we can touch, talk about bed and breakfast a situation where we're renting out your apartment. But anyway, in the hotel space, very few intermediaries. And if you're a hotel, you have to work with all of them, really. Like you want to be on Expedia. You want to be in the websites of all of those different brands. And I mean, there's so much research. There's so many articles about what those companies can do. Obviously, in places where they can, they establish price parity. So let's say price parity in Europe is illegal, for example. But in South America or in Asia, that's a fair game. So those companies, they can simply dictate, hey, you cannot on your website, on your own website, you cannot give a price that's better than on booking, for example, right? And so if you're a hotel right now, you have to work with those guys. Like that's where the eyes of the people are. These companies, the combined spend, as far as I remember from a few years ago, and the COVID might have changed the situation, of course, right? 
both the combined spend of Booking and Expedia on just the Google ads, nothing else, no other advertising was about $6 billion. So it was one of the bigger sources of revenue for Google. Per year? Per year. I remember this. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like three or four years ago. I saw that come out like there. You literally have Expedia and Booking.com, whoever, I don't know. For, I, like you said, I lose track of who owns who. <laughs> they actually come out with their quarterly stock guidance. And uh, there's a huge part of each one of them where they talk about like our Google ad spend, like our customer yeah. acquisition on our digital customer acquisition. You can look these up, right? So they literally, their CEOs come out on their quarterly guidance calls for their investors and say, uh, oh, you know, our results weren't so good because there was a Google algorithm change. And it's like CEO of the booking.com is talking to me about Google algorithm changes. Wow. This must be really serious business. <laughs> yeah. That makes well, sense. Well, yeah. So their business is, is, I guess, at the core of it is just marketing, just owning the eyes of the people. It's not even S- SEO or anything like that, but it's a brand. And I think those companies, they did, like before we had this tool, before we had blockchains, there was really no other way for, to create a marketplace, really, right? There was no other way for multiple buyers to meet multiple sellers. So for 20 years or for like 20 plus years, it was the only way, right, to do those things. And those companies, they did an incredible job at the time creating the brand and building things out. And sure, they created the, this infrastructure that now it's working right now. A lot of hotels, a lot of people are using it. And sure, kudos for that, right? But, and that's sort of the fate of all the companies are really right now that are operating within the operating system of capitalism that we have it today, right? Yeah, if you can become a monopoly, and that's unfortunately like, no, I don't buy that. I don't think it's good for anyone, really. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so you then, that's great. I'm glad that you didn't gloss over some of the details of the space because I didn't know some of that for sure. So that was great, great to learn from. So you got these learnings from being an entrepreneur, trying to build Roomstorm, and then went through the Roomstorm journey. Now you're at Winding Tree, I think three or four years ago. How did you even enter the larger Web3 space before you get to Winding Tree? Like it wasn't even called Web3 back then, right? This is like the new brand. This is, right. No, this is the third brand, I think. This is the third <laughs> round of branding we've gone through here, right? We had the previously had blockchains. Now we had crypto or it was the other way around. Now we're at Web3. So how did you enter this space? I mean, of course, like everyone was monitoring, like I'm a coder, I'm a geek. So about Bitcoin, about, about Ethereum, you know, about all of those things. And for quite some time, it was just a toy, right? It was just like, okay, there's Bitcoin. Some dude bought pepperoni pizza with it. Okay, that's cool. What else? Sort of, right? But then really when, I don't know, just something just clicked in me. I remember the moment exactly. And actually, I want to give kudos to my friend, Sam. I was on the phone with him. I was in New York, I remember, at one of the travel hackathons where despicable things were going on in terms of like guys who were at the hackathon were hacking local hotels through booking.com, making them pay crazy commission fees without actually getting any business, just showing how broken the system is. Man, it was fun. But anyway, and then the hotel CEO actually showed up at the hackathon because they invited him to show him like how messed up the whole system. Anyway, it was nuts. Ooh, that is definitely some guerrilla user research right there, man. I love it. It's like, hey, it's, we're going to break your website. Yeah. Come on over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Again, it was kind of a white hacking. So basically the guys were figured out, and sorry, it's tangents, definitely. They figured out if they create a bunch of transactions with fake credit card numbers through booking.com, which by the way, booking.com, I don't know if they changed that or not. They don't verify your credit card information. They just pass this thing directly to the hotel. So if it passes that checksum, what, basically if it passes checksum, it's fine then. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It used to work. At least it used to work that way. And so those guys, they created like a Python. But I mean, it was a silly thing. It was a yeah. very simple thing. The guy created like a bot that created a thousand transactions with fake generated credit card numbers. And then guess what? Hotel checks the credit card number doesn't work, so there is no booking. But they have to pay Booking.com the commission fee because the transaction went through, and like <laughs> they owed at the end of the day thousands of dollars to book. But anyway, I'm on the phone with Sam with my friend, 
and just discussing all of this insanity. He used to do like travel. He used to work on some sort of travel startup before as well. And I don't know, we're just kind of discussing this thing and just something clicked. And I'm like, got to do it, man. I got to do it. I got to take Ethereum or whatever the decentralized infrastructure there is and just create something that's not that. <laughs> got it. And so how did you go about starting it? This is an interesting question we always ask just for the entrepreneurs who come on the pod, just yeah. because some of them, if they're not, this is not, we're not only focused on Web3 stuff here. We definitely look at other stuff outside of it. So it's always interesting to hear, like, how did you go about funding it? Was it bootstrap? Did you fundraise? Tell us about that part of the story. Yeah, there is no recipe, really. I mean, first of all, I started talking to trial people about this, right? I needed confirmation. So that hackathon, I think it was 2015. And I'm like, all right. So I started sort of brainstorming about this thing. And then by the end of the year, and I spoke to many, many people in the trial space that confirmed, hey, yes, exactly. That's the problem. There is an intermediary, takes crazy commission fee, doesn't want to innovate, is a gatekeeper, really. They can de-platform you anytime, et cetera. So I wrote this article. And I published it on, on, I'm not kidding you, on LinkedIn. Nice boomer channel strategy you have there, so <laughs> I'm impressed. Well, that whole space, the trial is just like, that's where the trial people live. They're not on Twitter, largely. They're not on like Discord, right? So, why don't you Fair yeah, point. So you know your audience. I know my audience, exactly. So I published it there. And like next day, there's like 40,000 views and shares and comments, and like people telling me I'm an idiot, but a lot of people also saying, okay, this is great. Okay, good thinking, Max. And I'm like, all right, okay, I got to do this for real. Question. You're like ready to ask a question. Oh, no, anyway. you're good. Keep going. You're good. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm like, I got to do this for real. Started pitching it to, I don't know, some of my coder friends and other people. And really, it's just going around telling people about what you're trying to do. And with some people, it sticks. And they're like, oh, my God, this is the best. Let's do this. That's it's just, I don't know. No secret recipe. Was, we wanted to fundraise. We really wanted that. The year was at that point, 2017. Yeah. And I sort of pitched it to a few investors. I was in Silicon Valley at the time. I left by the end of 2017. Another podcast episode, by the way, have to be here. Oh, why I left. And yeah, so 2017, I go around, talk to investors, and I'm just understanding slowly that that's completely antithetical to, to what we're trying to do. If it's decentralized, it has to be decentralized on all levels. I started looking at it was just the beginning, really. I mean, imagine 2017, investors have no clue about what's happening, especially, well, I don't know why I said, especially Silicon, and Silicon Valley investors that should be sort of on the same, caught up with that technology by then. But I'm realizing raising money from investors, that's no go. Because at the end of the day, they own your ass. Like they, you are responsible to them to like the only metric that you will have to care about is giving money back to investors by law, by the operating system of capitalism, right? And yeah, so we didn't. So we put together, bootstrapped some of our own money, some friends gave us some money and stuff. But yeah, so it was enough to do an ICO in 2018. So that's how we started. Oh, nice. Okay. So you're in the ICO craze of 2018. Awesome. And I assume this was done on a mainnet on Ethereum? Yep. Great. So cool. So then at that part, so we kind of got through the how, right? And now, you know, when we look at now, it was four years ago from your ICO. Now, what really caught my attention when I was online internet stalking you and Winding Tree is that you have these budding partnerships with all these major bigwigs in the travel industry itself, right? Not just OTC or booking or what have you, but you, know, you got Air New Zealand, Swissport, Air France, KLM, Lufthansa. Can you tell us a bit about what is the nature of your partnerships with these folks and how did you manage to work with them? How did you get their attention? So in 2000. 17, 18. Again, like I'm sort of coming from the startup, trial startup ecosystem out of Silicon Valley, which they have a bunch of those events and pitch contests and stuff like that, which like we pitched a bunch of times what we're trying to do. People don't get it. Like really, they, they have no clue what's happening, right? But 
At the same time, the industry players like Lufthansa and Air New Zealand and Alliance, like they know that they're hurting. So, and we met Lufthansa, for example, at one of the events in, in Sunnyvale, right? And Lufthansa notoriously, you know, could have found articles about how Lufthansa says, no, intermediaries are taking such a large fee. So we have to sort of compensate for that. And so we have to include it on top of the ticket that you buy through an OTA if you don't buy directly with Lufthansa, which like there was an uproar about that. So we're like, hey, we should talk. Like that's exactly what we're trying to fix here, right? And so they were very excited. Like there were a few people who sort of understood the vision and for a while there was quite a bit of support from them. It was like with most airlines or other partners, I think it's just the marketing buzz that they wanted out of that. Like we are excited. I mean, we're at that point, anyone that we could work with we wanted to work with, right? We need to provide a concept. We need to prove it to others that, hey, there is a there is something viable going on here. Like we're not just smoking something and just saying all sorts of things. And so, yeah, we partnered with these guys. But as it turns out, for many of those companies, it was just the marketing buzz of like, hey, blockchain, we're doing something around blockchain. So that's they wanted. That's what they wanted to do. An so, internal guy at Lufthansa who just wants to get blockchain in his title, basically, is, is, the, is the push. Lufthansa, by the way, was one of the good ones when they, like, they really were trying to, like, to make it work. But I think they just wanted results right away, which I understand majority of travel companies, that's one of the secrets, but they're just trying to survive all the time. Like you would be surprised how unprofitable airlines in particular are. Like that's just insane. I mean, the joke in the industry that goes around is, do you want to be a millionaire? Do you want to have a million dollars? Well, invest a billion dollars in an airline. And that's how you get a million bucks. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and I think actually, well, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt you for a sec, but one thing I wanted to kind of get clarity on since you just touched on it anyway, is we talked about the economics of hotel booking industry when you were talking about Roomstorm a bit, right? There's this 20% or whatever take rate commission that's super gameable, like you said. What are the economics like for this travel booking industry relative to airlines? Is it kind of the same? Are we looking at the same type of numbers? The numbers are different. You know, like, for example, Lufthansa was fighting the 16 euro fee that GDS has put on top of the tickets that they sell through their system. But as far as I understand, it was a flat fee. But the problem is you have multiple different, in both industries, you have multiple different intermediaries, right? It's a whole separate presentation of how like those things work in the hotel space. In the hotel space, it's just mind-blowing to me how many intermediaries there are. Let's talk about them. As a hotel, let's say you have a property management system, then a client reservation system or customer reservation system on top of that, or maybe it's the same type of software, which you cannot control. You don't control that, right? I'm going to touch on why it's important. Then on top of that, you have a channel manager and cha- like it's, as channel manager helps you to go to booking.com and this other place and this plan. There's like 15 different channels, maybe as a you know, moderately sized hotel, you want to reach out to, right? I don't know the numbers, hotel people or like industry people, correct me. Like really am not an expert in those things. Like I know on the high level how those things work. Then the channel manager connects to those channels and like all of those people in supply chain, of course, they take their own fee, but that's not the end of it, right? So the front end, let's say booking front end or hotel beds or whatever, they have to get the information about your hotel somehow, the description, the name, the images, all of those. It's a completely separate company that monopolized the market as a hotel. If you want to be connected to those channels, it's not just this supply chain that you have to sort of be a part of. No, you have to pay to this other company that's going to host your own pictures and images for you. It's a startup idea, by the way. Someone wants to disrupt and put hotel images on IPFS and make them own it and like pay a very little to access yeah. those images. That idea is like right there. Please, Excellent. please go for it. Like there is a monopoly, right? There's a company that's called Leonardo. Look them up. Maybe oh. there are two companies. Leonardo by far is the biggest. Interesting. Yeah. Is that, are they a hotelier as well or no? 
Literally, it's just a company that hosts images of hotels. Wow. That's their business. Got it. <laughs> there you right? go. There's so that's like that's on winning that's on winding trees uh, roadmap, right? Year three years from now, you gotta gotta build IPFS and disrupt that. <laughs> nice. Absolutely. Okay, continue. I mean, it's just like this mind blowing that that thing is even a thing, right? So anyway, airline space sort of the same situation. You have the GDSs. So basically, in my article in 2016, I posted this image of like a terminal. It's like it's a computer terminal. Again, I don't know non technical people or like it's a thing, it's a little screen where you type commands. It's kind of like DOS. I don't know if you guys remember DOS, whoever is listening to this, right? So, but you type commands like CD, the name of the directory, and you enter that. That's how that in the GDS interface looks exactly like that. There's no clicking, there's no mouse functionality up until now, as far as I understand. Amazing. Nice. This is for airlines. This is for airlines. That's how you issue a ticket. Apparently, people who are experienced in that, like they can do that very quickly and easily. They're like, dup, 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 dup. Okay. okay, you got a ticket, sir. Well, thank That's you. That's exactly. I learned, by the way, I learned another thing, man. That's amazing. Like, this is what this is what's happening when I'm sitting at there trying to get <laughs> my flight change or something. And this is why there's so much exactly. stern. Yes, there is exactly what they're typing so much. Where I'm like, are you typing a poem? Right? Like, what's happening? Like, are you typing an email? Like, what is going on? Right? No, they're typing those commands and they're trying to figure out that there is availability and stuff like that's exactly what they're doing. Got it. But then in the airline space, there is like you have one channel that's monopolized, that's your availability, basically. There's one company that controls your not controls, but helps you to sort of transact to help them to transact with your inventory. I mean, so I have respect. I have, you know, a moderate amount of respect for legacy software. It works. I get it, you know, totally. But anyway, so there's, there's just one channel that helps you like to transact. There's the GDS, but then as an airline, you have to use two more companies at the very least. One company helps you publish your flight schedules, right? It's a monopoly. And another company, okay, in the United States and in Europe, those are two separate companies. So if you're an airline that flies sort of between those two regions you have to use both companies that like in both cases those things are pretty much monopolized right in the company there is this company in the united states there's a company it's called arc in europe there's iot billing services something so basically as an airline if you want to get money from your bookings you have to use one of those monopolies as well it's like it's this mesh of multiple different companies that as a user like you're paying all of them. You're like, you're sustaining all of them, right? Like those companies, those billion dollar companies, they sit there and exist because you give them money, you give them the support. And if you look at this mesh of craziness for today, you're like, no, you don't need that. That's just crazy. <laughs> Guys, what the hell? It's, I don't know. It's like looking, I don't know, I like make this comparison. You go to a supermarket and you have two choices. In most places these days, you can have a person who can help you to do like, whoop, whoop. it's a stupid job. I'm sorry, yeah. but it is, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to have a separate person who, by the way, like the cost of that person being there is several thousand dollars a year per month, right? You can do that yourself, right? You don't need to rely on this intermediary. Right? And it's exactly the case. Like we could with the modern tech, we can optimize so much of that, but we don't. And now that we just backed into it, man, I want to ask you then, we have a good understanding of how, how many take rates there are across the economy of booking, right? What does your blockchain-based solution open up? Which one of these things are you going after first? Like how, how does it all work? What are you tying together? Here it is. Here it goes. I don't, I'm every day I'm thinking about it. I'm still mind blown, by the way, like as a coder. And so I want to talk about our pilot in Amsterdam, by the way, that we did it for, yep, the, yep, please do for the DEF CON event, right? So basically what we created and we've been experimenting for a while. We've been working on all sorts of dead ends, uh, well, for, for several years really now trying to experiment what some of those partners, some of those airlines that again, some of them were honestly trying to do something here, but 
at some point they said, hey, there's COVID and we're just trying to survive. We'll fire our whole innovation team. So I'm sorry about this, but that's the reality. So COVID not, yeah, didn't really help. So in Amsterdam, what we tried is we put, and thanks to L2, we have quite a bit of a choice right now in terms of choosing a layer two that sits on top of Ethereum instead of paying $30 transaction fees on Ethereum mainnet, right? So thanks to that, we just put a smart contract on Gnosis chain and we put hotel inventory into that smart contract. So basically, again, to those maybe who don't understand what a smart contract is, it's a mind-blowing innovation in the field of writing computer programs, right? Which allows you to have money as a primitive in your computer program, as a variable, right? Before... In any industry, you always had to deal with two different systems, always, right? Whatever you sell, but let's take a hotel, for example, right? Or an airline. There was this, I I tried to book, I don't know, a few weeks ago. I think maybe I was even flying to Amsterdam, right? I, I was trying to book a ticket and I go to the airline website and I'm a customer. I log in with my credentials and everything. I choose the flight. I give them my credit card information and like a pop-up appears. It's like, oh, booking was a success. Then another pop-up appears. Oh, no, there was an error. But then another pop-up appears like, no, it was success still. And I'm like, guys, just make up your mind. But I just trust like it went through and uh, silly me. I just closed that stupid window. And a few days later, I'm like, ah, shit, I forgot when my booking is, when my yeah. flight is. So I go to my email. Nothing, no information. I go to the airline website where, again, I'm a customer and I log in and I go to my bookings, nothing there. I'm like, okay, maybe it didn't go through, but I go to my credit card statement and the transaction is there. I'm like, what the flip? I go to the support channel of that airline and I click chat and they're like, yeah, hey, customer number 735, not a joke, 700 something in line. So I had to wait for like an hour and a half to chat with them. And I explained to the support guy, like, here's what happened. They were able at the end of the day to locate the reservation. <laughs> but like, like, it's such a stupid concept. You go to my bookings of an airline and they're like, your bookings will appear here. But if they don't, enter your booking information over here and we'll look it up for you. I'm like, what is this nonsense? But anyway, so now... Why is this happens? Because the airline has to deal with two separate systems. One system, the credit card system, the payment system, is this black box that sits over here. And you can peek into it as that support guy did at the end right. of the day, right? And then there's a completely different system, which is tasked with issuing the ticket and you know creating the reservation and booking the seat. Those are two separate systems. And there's this confused guy who sits in the middle who is like all day long he's doing basically uh, like it's just nonsensical by the way if you're not watching jimmy you can't see maxim's face and we can he is doing the uh the cashier's checkout you know swipe essentially (laughs) there you (laughs) go like that's the equivalent just in case you're wondering why he goes boop there you go. We're, we it's, need to narrate for accessibility. A, <laughs> there should be a transcript and subtitles at the end of the day. I hope you guys do that. Anyway, so we have to combine the information, make sense, two separate systems. This guy is like, oh, you claim that you have a booking. Give me your name. Okay. Did you pay? Okay, let me look into this other system and see whether you paid. And if you did, I will give you the ticket. But if you don't, you didn't, get up of here. Vice versa, right? So there could be a situation that the transaction went through, but like the money transaction, but they didn't receive the booking. Or it could be that I, for some reason, by mistake, I received the booking, but the money transaction didn't go through. And so you can, at the end of the day, there's a lot of fraud. There's like billions of dollars that just, you know, slip through the cracks and that's it, right? But anyway, with smart contracts, Sorry for the long explanation. I tend to no, do that. No, no, please. We're almost there. We're almost there. No, no, this so, is great because most other people don't. They get into the jargon and we have to slow them down. So this is perfect. perfect. Please continue. Right. <laughs> right. So with smart contracts, those two separate systems, the payment and the booking system, are combined. It's the same program. And the program says, so 
buying the ticket is the same transaction that sits on the blockchain, right? Instead of two completely separate transactions of like, here's my credit card transaction and give me back the ticket, please, which are two separate systems, which we'll have to make sense out of. With the smart contract, it's the same transaction where the smart contract that has all the conditions under which the booking can be made, it has all the details. And so the payment and the receiving of the ticket, it's the same transaction. And so you remove that person, the poor person in the middle that has to sort of reconcile all that BS that's going on all the time, right? And so, then along the way, maybe you have addressed the fact, it sounds like the intermediaries are involved in all of those, right? So if we get a little specific about that, which going down one deep, one, one maybe not one, one level deeper, one level up, actually, something like 100 nights were reserved, right, through your platform That's right. for Amsterdam for DevConnect, right? And then the other part that caught my eye was you said a 50% discount, right, delivered for, I guess, the consumers, right? And potentially sure. even Doubletree, right, which was doing the pilot with you. How Tell us about that discount. Where did that come from? How does that all work? Look, look, a lot of people, again, a lot of people are super excited in the travel industry about just this idea of experiment with things. They really want to do something. We talk to hoteliers, we talk to the people from airlines. They want to do, they want to change things up. It's just simply they can't with the intermediaries. But so we gave to what we did for Hilton in Amsterdam, we gave them a separate website, really gave them like a separate website where they could upload what they could say, hey, we have this many rooms available on such and such date. Here are some images. They didn't have to go through a freaking separate company to upload their images. Like you upload everything. Everything is there. Everything is in one place. That partially that information is stored on the blockchain. Partially, of course, it's like on IPFS or, or whatnot. Right. And that's it. Like they own that information. They own that account. Although it's on a smart contract that we wrote. We can't change it. We can't just take their money or change their information or close their account, which again, like the intermediaries of today, they do that routinely, routinely. I was touching upon, again, the issue of like price parity and stuff like that, which in Europe is illegal. But if you don't comply, they can just tell you, oh, sorry, for whatever reason, which we don't have to explain the reason to you, you're no longer our customer. So goodbye. Thank you very much. Right. And so we cannot do that. Right. And so, so that's what we did. And so the Hilton, we pitched it to Hilton and they loved it so much. And I mean, partially the 50% discount, 55 0, 50% discount came from the fact that there was no intermediary. But partially, of course, because those people were very excited to sort of try those things out. And yeah, I mean, that was a busy time. The not one night at that hotel was like 200 bucks. Oh, sorry, $400. And we got it back down to about 200, which is still quite high, but this is Amsterdam and this is the center of Amsterdam right next to the train station and within like 10 minutes from the venue. So it was, I think it was a great deal for everyone. And at a time when something like 15, 20,000 people are coming in, right? So the demand is also going up. I mean, that's not yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so then looking at this from the perspective of a business, then what did you guys do? Did you charge a commission, 0% commission, 1%? How does that all work? So the only thing that we had to do there is the hotel told us, hey, we are not quite ready to accept crypto right now. So help us convert it. So the XDAI on Gnosis chain, they they said, hey, the corporate didn't approve this and whatnot. So help us convert it to Europe, which we did. And we charged fee on top of that. Well, actually, it wasn't even us. It was our a company that's helping us to bring corporate partners onto this winding tree marketplace. So they did that. We did actually with this one, we charged zero commission. The winding tree didn't get anything out of this one at all, which in the future, we're planning to introduce a 1%, we we'll call it treasury contribution, I guess, that would go into the smart contract again, which is not owned by us, but owned by the whole community, by hoteliers, by travelers, by, by literally everyone who uses the system. And that money is going to be there. So money will stay within the system anyway, right? So virtually zero commission. So yeah, that's the idea. 
And then I think we've talked to a lot of people who have started cooperatives, who have been thinking of other forms of organization outside of the LLC or the C Corp or S Corp or what have you. So what about you folks right now? You're going to be, you're going to have a revenue generating mechanism. You have a team to support. What are you thinking of beyond this 1% take rate for the community treasury? Is it just going to be that? Is there going to be a token that gives you rights to ownership in it? How does it, what are you thinking of there? So there is a token that we have, which, so basically the idea is that whenever booking is made, the logic here is simple. Whenever there, someone uses the platform, therefore gives value to the platform, does something with it, like gives it, uses it. And there is a 1% treasury contribution that goes into the treasury smart contract. That smart contract is going to mint a certain number of tokens. We're not, we're working on the math of sort of how it's going to be done. But in return, you get a token, which will give you the right to own part of the platform, I guess, here and vote on the decisions or on whether, I don't know, whatever it is, whether the commission, the treasury contribution fee should be reduced or increased or whatever it is, right? All the other details. So that's going to be owned by the community. And right now we have an LLC right now, which is, but it's a form that's called company that's limited by guarantee, not by shares. So we have like a board of directors that preside over that, but virtually like we don't have shares. We don't have anything like that. And really like several years ago when we were starting this, we didn't know how to do it the right way. We tried to go the Ethereum way, like to start a foundation in Switzerland that was that proved to be very, very complicated to work with Swiss authorities. And I guess like you have to have a ton of money. You have to have millions right. and millions and millions of dollars to do that. Yeah, I know some folks that went the route of like a cooperative in France, which is working out for them. But I personally, I think the future is the DAOs, the centralized organizations. And the reason for that is, again, with current operating system of capitalism, we're bound by its rules. So, I mean, obviously, if you're, quote, unquote, and I'm doing air quotes right now, decentralized project is a for-profit corporation that has VC funding, I'm sorry, but NGMI, man, sorry. Like, I don't think anyone (laughs) would want their future internet computer owned by a bunch of dudes from Silicon Valley. No. Like, yes, but. NGMI not going to make it just so you all know. I mean, everyone hopefully knows, but just in case, <laughs> what does yeah. he mean by that? So, I think this is interesting because I think y'all have to really think through this a little bit I, on the community side, right? Because you correct, as you correctly pointed out, right? Community is this fluid concept that actually has a lot of baggage, right? The community in your case could be hoteliers, airlines, uh, travelers. It could be builders from your DAO. It can be a number of people, right? So when you get into the tokenomics of this thing, right? If I like hit the brakes today, June 1st and said, hey, what do you think makes sense in terms of ownership for this platform going forward for the next year to correctly incentivize building on it, getting people into it? Like, what would you say? I would say that no one knows really how to do it correctly. And we have to build and we have to experiment with those systems. And it's something that I think about every day, like how to reconcile again, like, okay, there is traveler and they spent a thousand dollars on a hotel, right? And they contributed to sort of the development of the platform, but then there's a hotel who has accepted that customer. And so therefore they provide the inventory. Are they, should they own And sort of in my head, I'm just thinking like they have to have the same share in the platform after this transaction, right? Because they sort of contributed. It's like thermodynamics, like there's an action and there is a sort of action and that goes the opposite way, right? But like they're both valid, like it cannot, one cannot exist without the other. So they partake in the same transaction. Yeah. How do you reconcile that with there is a developer who built a chunk of the system and they're, of course, contributed to the platform greatly. How should they be compensated for their contribution? It's a very interesting topic. Right. There's one of our earlier episodes. We had one of the directors of um, Ethic Hub on the show. And so like 
it's not exactly the same type of project, but it's multi-stakeholder and they're trying to think of it. I see some parallels here, right? So for instance, mm-hmm. you know, for those who are hearing it for the first time, Ethic Hub basically provides an under collateralized DeFi loan platform where folks can come in on Gnosis Chain as well, just like you, <laughs> for very, the same reasons. Sure. They come in and can create um, loan pools for specific coffee cooperative projects in Chiapas, Mexico, and soon in Brazil, across Brazil, and um, a couple of their Ecuador. And so what they do is you, as Maxim, can go there and stake $2,000 and die for an 8% yield right and they have a one percent default rate over the last five years and so what they then do is the folks on the other end of that take your money and they go and exchange it they're organized as a cooperative because they can legally own a crypto wallet right they're an entity that can own one smallholder farmers individuals mm-hmm. it goes far way harder for them to do so and so one of the things then that they do they go change that crypto to money fiat right pesos and they go and finance that season's harvest and they might even sell pre-sell some of it back to ethic hub itself right and then ethic ethic hub will pay an ethics and half ethics half fiat or they'll change the proportion depending on what the person wants the idea being that now you as the grower as the supplier of coffee to the chain and as the receiver of loans have a stake in it right and so I think right. like on your side, it definitely makes sense to me when I think about it through the hotels or, or airlines point of view for them to have a stake in it. Because when I zoom out and look at the landscape of Expedia and booking, I think Expedia owns booking. I don't remember, but Priceline or someone, right? There's like those oligopolies that run this and then are also privy to the demand aggregating behaviors of Google and the other oligopolies that are yeah. upstream of them. It just makes sense to some extent for the people who are providing the real world service to have some stake in it, be governors in it. I don't want to make anyone feel sorry for the airline industry, but I'm just saying, right? Like it makes sense from the perspective of stakeholders, right? And so then coming back around to it, I can go and buy ethics myself as a consumer today and stake it or provide liquidity that then goes into the platform for loans. But that's a bit different here, right? But you're buying a service, right? For you folks. So I wonder yeah. on the consumer side how much sense it makes for people to own the rails on it. Maybe there's a membership tier. Maybe there's like some way where like you are actually participating it beyond just consuming, right? And because I would even say on the developer side, if you're building and maintaining the rails of this thing and then participating in its governance, I, from my perspective, I'd say you're probably a more valuable participant than someone who's just hitching a ride. And even though I am a person who would just be hitching a ride, right? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think yeah. about that? So I think there are so many models and we're really like our mode of existence is cooperation and collaboration. Like we are really an open book and anyone can come. So I don't think a small team like ours and we have, I guess, 10, 15, 20 people at any given point. Like we cannot think about all the different potentials that can exist here. Like we thought, I mean, we brainstorm about things like exactly what you're talking about. I mean, essentially what those Ethic Hub is doing is like futures on on your crops, right? We're thinking about like as a hotel, you could pre-mint your inventory for the next year and sell it on the free market here, provide the statistics about how much you're making on average and stuff like that. And that's one of the mechanisms that actually hotels can benefit here from because notoriously, notoriously, they're so bad at their setting their price, like they have to hire a separate company to do that for them. That's another company that they're paying, by the way. Like there's just, again, there's like a whole bunch of companies that are sucking the blood out of these guys at the end of the day, right? But like, we're like, what if it was just on the free market, you saying, hey, October, 2022, or November or December, maybe even next year, you're like, hey, this was my demand and prices this year. And so I'm putting out my inventory up for an auction. Anyone can buy it and then reset it. The whole thing is, of course, is an NFT. And there are some rules that are built in there that if you resell it, you get a little bit like a royalty at the end of the day, right? So I think that would be a very valuable mechanism here. I also love this because I'm imagining Martin and I are based in Barcelona and I'm imagining just like 
getting a bunch of people together and buying a bunch of hotel inventory and not reselling it to keep tourists out. <laughs> right. Just like funny use cases like that. So I'm like, look, I'll tell you, I've lived here in Barcelona for three years. And I think one of the early, my Spanish teacher early in 2020 was just like, this place is such hell every year. There's 15 million people that come to visit it. It's the worst place to be in summer. And so I'm kind of a little bit happy of the, like, this COVID stuff is happening. And then I thought to myself, oh, like, yeah. this is literally you. an economic tool that Instead, like you walk around through Barcelona and you will see tourists go home spray, spray painted in English everywhere, right? Like it's, and there's no recourse really for anyone who wants to say, because like people are like, oh, well, it's a free market, this, that, and the other. And it's like, well, if you're a part of that community, there's literally no recourse for you to actually say, this part of it, we don't really want to touristify, right? And like yeah. in some ways, you live there. So it's not to say that tourists are evil or bad, it's just about agency. Right. Yeah. So like that, I think is a pretty interesting use case for your thing to just be like, you know what, do you think we can get through yield only like a million dollars, put somewhere to generate yield to buy out like a, just a week's time to give ourselves some respite from the tourists <laughs> with, yeah, with yeah, the wide yeah. tree. <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing use case. And really, I'm just thinking about like it all boils down to this concept of the tragedy of the commons, right? Like, let's all agree that we don't want more than a certain number of tourists, something like that. But then it's a free market. And so one company says, I'm going to cheat the system a little bit. So I'm going to yep. sell, I don't know, whatever, for a cheaper or more inventory or whatever. And yeah, we have to, it's all about coordination at the end of the day, right? And I have you read the paper, the Ralph Merkel paper, Dow and Democracy? No, I don't think so. I don't think I've read yeah, that. Yeah, look it up. It's like he's talking exactly about this. Like his concept is every stakeholder within the community. I read it several years ago, but, but in my head, the concept is like whatever the decision is going to be made, the whole community votes about how decision is going to make them happier or less happier. And yeah, at the end of the day, you take a measurement and if a certain decision makes the community on average sort of or in absolute numbers, I don't remember the math there, but if the community is happier at the end of the day, uh, when that decision is implemented, then sure, let's implement it, et cetera, et cetera. But because yeah, I, I mean, there are multiple different stakeholders there, right? There are hotels who are like, no, we want as much business as possible. But of course, it's not sustainable. Of course, the community is hurting. Of course, there is crime that's involved with all of that and drug and whatever, right? So, yeah, no, that it opens up a really interesting design space and it actually goes into a tragedy that comments. So, I think like there's an interesting movement here too, as well. We've interviewed a number of people on the pod who come from this, but folks like Token Engineering Commons, the Common Stack, these folks who are trying to ostensibly build digital tools for commoning, right? So, and I look at your product you guys are putting out, right? And that's something that I'd just like to get your opinion on, right? So like if you have, right now you're trying to build a viable business out of it, which totally makes sense, but making this more of a common, a tool that transfers to community ownership, right? Where you have a community treasury that can govern how that thing is used and have at least evolve to something where this is just a commons-based ownership thing for a commodity, honestly, at the end of the day, sure. right? The travel yeah. booking is just something that yeah. you pointed out, I hope, <laughs> I hope you don't disagree with this too much, but through the winding road we've taken in the last hour, it's almost like you've disintermediated so many of these folks or that's on your roadmap that it would then make sense for it to be some kind of a publicly owned or stewarded project right oh, look, look like again from the very beginning and and sorry that we're getting at it only after like almost an hour but i should have made sure that it is a public good and so let me correct you by the way you said i'm trying to bin, build a viable business here i'm not i'm trying to build a public good platform that's owned by the community from the very beginning and maybe we're a little bit too idealistic. I don't want to compromise from the very beginning. And many people took that path, right? That they took money from VCs and now they're liable to them. And now they cannot really go anywhere without either breaking the fiduciary duty concept here, or I don't know how those things will play out. We did, we never raised money from VCs. This is owned by the community. 
I'm only self-proclaimed, sure, steward of the community, but if anyone who is more vocal than me and who, I don't know, just really with the right ideals comes around, I'm happy to work with those people or follow those people. But this is a public good. This is a community-owned platform, and it's not a business. In no way, this is a business. This is, we're building a new type of organization, and that's why it has to be a DAO where we can operate outside of the existing operating system of of capitalism, again, where you are liable for all the money that you get. And I'm not saying that we, as a team right now, who worked on this for several years now, that we're not liable to sort of the community because they supported us along the way. And we want to make it work for all the stakeholders here. And we're so grateful to the community, again, that supported us in in 2018 through ups and downs over the course of these years. But there are multiple stakeholders here. Like those people are not just the single most important stakeholders, which VCs in the traditional space are, right? Like you are working as a founder, you took money from VCs. Now you're working for these guys. That's it. Like that's the end of your Definitely. sort of journey. So yeah, that's it. That's what I think about it. <laughs> No, cool, man. I think that's a pretty comprehensive answer. I think it's good to at least get it out in the open. Yeah, I think this at least aligns with some of the more idealistic things I've heard out there, which I'm not using that as an insult, right? Is that like you, if you can build it as a public good, then hopefully it ends up being more reachable by more people, right? Because like, it's actually pretty, you think about the scope of how much even you think it's just about carbon, right? There's some real weird contradictions in the current system where like you go to Google flights or Skyscanner or what have you, and they tell you, oh, by the way, did you know that the carbon impact of your flight is this much? And it's just like, I literally don't give a shit. And it's not just because I don't care about the environment. It's more that like, you're just throwing this number in my face. Like it's a thing that I'm responsible for. Whereas if I didn't get this ticket, they would have this happening anyway. And we already know this, right? So like if we can actually realign the incentives around this, it makes a ton of sense for all of us to like, even when you have with winding tree, you could dial into other protocols that then actually say, Hey, by the way, this isn't some intermediary. You can pay to offset this thing on return protocol, which is a company that does this actually. like It connects into DeFi protocols and says, hey, this transaction you're about to do, if you pay $5 extra, you offset it, right? Yeah, uh, we go into yeah. a registry and we do that. So that a comprehensive solution to it being a public good would include that and it would not be a contradiction, I think, right? And that, that would be- Yeah, kind of cool. yeah, no, like, exactly. You're absolutely right. And that's like sort of a concept that I discussed multiple times with people, with stakeholders in multiple different places. I had a call with a guy in Africa who's like, they have the same problem. It's not about carbon, right? And I mean, we have a few of these buzzwords that are flying around carbon offsetting. Like that problem exists on so many different levels, right? So I'm talking to this guy. He is like investor or something like that in Africa. And he's telling me about the travel industry sort of in those regions, right? Where you have safari lodges that are supposed to invest a certain amount, a certain percentage of your booking towards conservation projects. And they just tell you like, hey, yeah, we're going to do 30% of your money will go to how do you know that they sent that there how do you know that they're not lying to you and because the yeah the amount of lying that goes around everywhere not just travel industry of course it's just crazy like yeah yeah, this people you go on booking.com that's my favorite part you go on booking.com and you book a hotel and at the bottom of like the book button or somewhere next to it they say as a customer you pay no commission fee like it's entirely commission free to you i'm like do you think I'm an idiot? Do you th- like who pays the commission fee if not the customer at the end of the day? Like really, who funds this whole supply chain? At the end? And yeah. I know that the hotel is going to pay 20% to you. And that's just to you, not to people. I fund the whole supply chain. Therefore, I pay all the commission fee- fees here. Anyway, this is just a disgusting line, right? And so it's the same with all of those, the carbon offset. Yeah, how do I know that the money goes towards, I mean, I have to trust you here as an intermediary again and regarding carbon offsetting i was in iceland a couple of weeks ago talking to some travel industry stakeholders there and just out of curiosity i went i've never as as you just like you i've never done that i never offset my carbon right maybe i should i don't but it's exactly the thinking that goes inside my head i don't know what that money's going like you can say whatever to me right so i go to iceland 
And Iceland is pretty expensive. So it's about $800 just for my hotel stay, a few hundred dollars for the flight and stuff like that. So they have a very useful website. You go there and you enter all of that information, how long you're staying in Iceland, what kind of diet you have, of course, because eat meat, your carbon footprint is higher, et cetera, et cetera. You enter all of that. And at the end of the day, for my week-long stay in Iceland, they, they tell me, oh, your carbon footprint is about 670 kilograms, whatever. And they're like, okay, you can offset, they round it up, your offset, you can offset 1,000 kilograms, one ton of CO2, you got to pay 15 euro for that. Which is, I mean, it's not a lot of money, but then knowing that just booking took about 200 commission, 200 euro commission fee on that. Like you could offset my carbon footprint with the booking commission fee 10 times over and you would have right. some left for beers and some other crazy thing. Or I don't know, invest it into saving whales and snails and whatnot. Can we stay on this for one second? Because I'm getting caught up and I'm, I'm starting to jump in kind of 75 minutes <laughs> of listening and, and been really enjoying it. And so I didn't want to mess up the flow, but... Where I'm getting held up is like, we started out the conversation where we talked about for booking.com, it's so important to be paying for ads on Google or paying essentially search engine marketing and you're paying billions of dollars a year. And they're taking this booking fee and then they're reinvesting it in to that advertisement. And what I'm trying to get my head around is how does this application become viral over time? Because you don't have that you don't have that kind of mechanism for continually reinvesting this take rate into advertising yeah. to break up the monopsony. I mean, it's not really a monopsony, but the oligarchy or the sure. Ol sure. oligarchy that you're talking about. Oligarchy. oligopoly. Oligopoly. Thank you. And so, and this is something that there's venture capitalists at Redpoint, Tomas Tungas, he's written a lot about this and he looks at kind of customer acquisition costs in web two versus web three. And these tokens actually have a significantly higher customer acquisition cost. And so it'd be helpful to hear from you just how you think about virality and how you think about getting the application to a stage where there's enough users and there's enough demand and there's enough brand presence that it kind of, the CAC comes down so that you don't have to be kind of funneling all this money into search engine marketing. That's right. This is like, you hit it on the nail. You're absolutely right. There's, as we said, you know, so basically the question boils down to this. How do we compete with $6 billion that Booking and Expedia together spend every year on advertising? Like, how do you even fight that, right? And our strategy and our approach to this is the following. Of course, you cannot compete with the query hotels in London, right? Which is, has a very high cost per click, right? But we could target, we could go, it's not just about Google. Right. We could go like, for example, in Iceland, I'm, I'm talking to a few influencers, right, which produce amazing, amazing content on different platforms. Right. Why shouldn't we give them an opportunity to, I don't know, very easily to attract their viewership to that destination? Let's say they post a picture, they post a video about a certain location and just say, hey, clicking here and booking a trip to this destination. Not only you're just supporting me and my channel, but also you are bypassing all the intermediaries that are charging 20% commission fee. Your carbon offset is offset right off the bat, like everything. And the money goes into the smart contract and are being distributed directly to all the providers that are going to be a part of this transaction. Yeah, I think that's one. I think that's one right. area. That's, that could, I mean, it's just like behind the scenes. Go yeah, ahead. I think that's one area where this could work. The other area would be to say, and th you've been working on this for five years in this market better than I will ever know it. But another way to think about this is to say, who's actually harmed by the booking fee? It's not clear that the consumer is harmed, right? Because the consumer has so much choice in terms of where they can book. You can make an argument that the consumer is harmed, but I think it'd be a hard argument to make because we have so much availability and so much choice when we go to these platforms that aggregate you don't. all of this. You don't. you don't. I'm sorry. You don't have a choice. Okay. It's well, an illusion of put, choice. Let, let's just put kind of a sure. Put uh, it on the show. That sure. And we can come back to it. So maybe consumers yeah. have choice. Maybe they don't. Sure. I mean, when I go to kayak.com, I have a, you know I have a ton of choice, right? When it comes to some of this stuff, right? And just in terms of pricing. So mm -hmm. another way to think about it might be to say, and, and I've not seen business models yet in the Web3 space. But to me here, 
who's really harmed is the hotelier or it's, it's essentially whoever is it's the community, right? It's the community themselves. Yeah. Yep. And rather than Absolutely. cut the take rate down, you could just say, we're going to give that take rate to whoever brings the client in, right? So if that the Hilton has excess demand, they could go and say, we're going to actually send some, we know that we can get, we have some sort of trading margin on this and we can pass that demand on to this boutique by us. And so you essentially use the system against itself and are passing on that take rate to the hotel year to essentially incentivize everyone in a cooperative model to work together to break the intermediaries. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of a different approach to this. And, and I've not seen that to date, but I always come back to this kind of, I always come back to this, like, well, how is a 1% take rate going to compete against a 20% take rate in terms of just the way that search engine marketing works? So I'll be really interested I, I think to see a, where you guys yeah. end up on this model. Thank you for talking about this. This is insanely important, you know, and I would love to send it over to travel folks that we talk to all the time. This is a very important conversation. But this is a David and Goliath kind of problem. I mean, you can just throw money and you just can buy, as those big companies do, where you can just buy out all the keywords about hotels in London, hotels in Iceland, hotels and blah, blah, blah. Or you can just work smart and just like, again, here, we want to create a marketplace really where people will be competing on how, like imagine as an OTA, as a travel agency, right? If you have access to all of that inventory, but you've got to be competing with a thousand different people like you or companies, right? On how creative you, like how you will be competing on customer acquisition costs, basically at the end of the day, right? If we had equal access to the information into the distribution, right? That's what you would be doing. And there are so many... I don't know those creative ways that those destinations could be marketed, right? But again, influencers from those spaces and maybe hotels themselves, maybe they have ideas. But right now, and that's precisely why we're creating Lightning Tree. Right now, they have no way of implementing those ideas. Like there is no, you cannot innovate. You cannot experiment. You have no access to this data, right? And that's why we're creating Lightning Tree. Like we want those people to have creative, new, cheap interesting ways of reaching those audiences, right? And promoting their destinations like that. And also you were talking about the harm that communities are suffering from, right? And I think it's a very, very important question or sort of topic to talk about maybe a little bit. I know I'm way over time at this point already, right? So imagine, so I was in Iceland again, learning about a phenomenal place, by the way. Have you been to Iceland, guys? You have? Never. Okay. Martin. Like, the space is magical by itself, just the nature, just everything, the hot springs, the, like all that stuff. Just you have this magical, th- I personally have, right? But then it's a community of 300,000 people. It's a small town, really, anywhere else in the world. But they have a ton of music. They have several airlines. They have like so many creative people. I don't know. Maybe the nights are long there in winter and they have nothing else to do. Maybe that's the case. And they have like a lot of time to spend inside and just brainstorm and just build stuff. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's something in the water, right? But that community is super creative. And that community of 300,000 people and with the GDP uh, a couple of years ago of $25 billion, their income, a whole one third of their income is from tourism. So divide, okay, it's so slightly less than $8 billion is from tourism. And let's say 10 to 20% of that income is extracted by some corporation that's with a seat somewhere in Ireland, so they don't pay taxes, right? A billion dollars or maybe more is extracted from that community by some sort of multinational, transnational corporation. Through like right? capital flight. Or for nothing else. And like, yeah. what? Are we going to stop traveling to Iceland if booking all of a sudden said, or like, let's say there is no Iceland on booking. Will you say, oh, oh shit, there's no Iceland on booking. Therefore, I'm not going. No, you will still go there, right? You will go, you'll find on Google or whatever, DuckDuckGo or whatever the search engine you have. You will find hotels there. You will find flights there without booking advertising, right? And so... What I'm saying is a billion plus dollars is probably, and again, that's my guess, is extracted from that community every year. And then I see projects like, oh, let's do reforestation in Iceland. We need $25 million. We need this. Like at the same time, you're paying that troll 
heaps of money every year, which you could like you could have again offset the carbon for all the travelers. You could have turned all the cars in Iceland to electric cars. You could have like you could have done so many amazing things. You could have invested that money into it. it's not just about humans, by the way. Like it's about animals, it's about the nature. How many things we could have done with that amount of money that just right now is being burnt in Google Ads? Because those, again, Booking.com doesn't care how crafty they are about those ads, right? They just yeah, yeah. I just wanna, like I want to push back one more time on this because I think like you're really on to something here. And I would say that if you incentivize that community, so two things. You can incentivize individuals and you could incentivize local providers by cutting them into the booking. But there's also yeah. another group that you could incentivize, right? So if I'm the Hilton in Reykjavik, right? And I have 100% capacity for 30% of the year, that 30% of the year, I could use my email marketing list to market all of the local providers, all the boutiques, because you're cutting me into the 20%, right? Yeah. And so like if you enlist as allies, all of the big brands to essentially market to their groups because they get the take rate. It's kind of another model than saying, we want to get rid of the take rate. And the reason we want to get rid of the take rate is because it hurts hoteliers. Kind of the more baller model is to say, we're going to give the take rate to the hoteliers. We're going to give the take rate to the local community. And we're essentially going to take these email lists of millions of people and use them as like guerrilla warfare against booking.com like that's this the way that brilliant. that's the way that i would i'm so it. excited this is so brilliant oh my god this is amazing all right let's work on it man i was Do gonna say a, some spare bro, time apart bro, from this is, podcast <laughs> that is the kind of shit i live for is what i was saying man i love it because that's like that's the entire reason that i even got into like raising a fund or whatever right it's like what kind yeah. of really economic insurrectionary type things can we do with the stuff that's out there right because it's not just about yeah. like, I'm not hurling any insults at any specific people, but there's been a lot of stuff written in the last two years around, oh, you're, the take rate is bad and blockchain should eliminate it. It's like, oh, you little baby, you're just thinking about it in such a simple way, <laughs> right? There's actually yeah, yeah, really yeah, interesting. Yeah. There's more. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So, but you're Martin. absolutely, you know, Martin, first, yeah, brilliant. And how do we teach those people that document it? You know, like one of the major things that we are sort of encountering here with all those people is education. I talk to travel people every day, right? And there is a simple litmus test that I ask them. Well, actually, there are two questions I ask them. Hey, do you have any crypto? That's the first question. Some of them, I don't know, let's say 5 to 10% are like, sure, yes. Do you own your private keys? Zero percent. No one knows what the wallet is. No one what knows like what sort of, what kind of concepts are behind this and we need to educate them about it and but you're absolutely right that within our system winding tree is set up in such a way that as i said the inventory is out there it's in the open it's accessible to anyone nothing theoretically should prevent hilton from accessing that and advertising those other hotels in that community in that locality to their user base because they're fully booked for it yeah you're absolutely right and they can already do that And then like another service, like you could essentially create a filter for local ownership, right? And so like, you could just make it really easy for people to market local ownership when they have access to it. I mean, I've I've got like a million ideas here. I'm sorry. I've got down like a rabbit hole, you know? So so anyway, when you're here in Barcelona, we'll we'll talk more. We'll grab a coffee and we could talk about this. I don't want to... I don't want to take our podcast listeners too far down kind of a diversion here. Well, I mean... Yeah, so we'll we'll grab some cava. Yeah, we got to have you on again at some point, I think, because we covered all the background. But now this is honestly, this is where all the ownership economy stuff gets really interesting, right? So, yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, yeah, we won't yeah. get back into it. We'll cut it there. It has been, we are a bit over on time. We want to respect your time <laughs> as well. Last thing we like to wrap up with is where can folks follow your work online and stay in touch with Winding Tree? Guys, go to so Winding Tree. We are doing a little bit of a rebrand right now. We're going to be win. Easier to pronounce, easier to type, easier web address. So go win.so and on the bottom there, you have Discord links and Twitter and stuff like that. So we have quite an active Discord on Twitter. We tend to post stuff. We tend to post stuff on YouTube. So all those usual channels. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your time, Max. And this has been fascinating. And at least we learned... I learned, I don't know, Martin already knew, but I definitely learned a bit about how all this stuff works behind the scenes. And of course, so many opportunities, right? Like every one of these inefficiencies can be addressed in some way. It's just about 
getting mapping that to real life value from the landscapes that you're actually working in. So super cool to see. Thanks a lot for your time, man. Thank you, Jihad. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Excited. Super excited to be here. Cheers.